Welcome to a very special archived edition of People of the Free Gift Teaching Through the Bible. And that means it could range anywhere from current day to 10 years ago. And so this is People of the Free Gift, where we grab believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. And if you're new here, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and enable notifications so you won't miss any of our teachings through the Bible, which we release at least once a week and many times several times a week. And so we're so glad that you joined us. In the book of Acts... We're told by Luke that after Jesus rose from the dead, that for a period of 40 days, he stayed with his disciples and showed himself to be alive by many infallible proofs. And so as we've been from the time of Advent last year started, we've been following the life and ministry of Jesus Christ starting with his birth, going through his life and his ministry and his teaching, and then culminating with his death and resurrection on Easter morning. And now for the next 40 days, in following the story, I thought it would be a good chance for us to take a look at why it is that we believe in Jesus. What motivates us to get up in the morning on Sundays when others are sleeping in or going out shopping? What motivates us to do such a thing that's so different amongst many other different things that we do because we believe in this person, Jesus of Nazareth, that he was the Messiah that was promised so long ago. And so today, I want to talk about Jesus as the fulfillment of prophecy. And in preparing this week, I found that the best way to do so was just to let you see for yourself how much of Jesus' ministry was a fulfillment of prophecy. And it, to do so, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to take a journey through the gospel accounts of the crucifixion. Just that one event, a very important event, one in which we stake the claim that we have forgiveness of sins on. And as we go through the gospel story, we're going to encounter the various prophecies that were fulfilled during that time. And as we do so, we're also going to be singing the songs of the faith, the great hymns that have been written in response to these various truths. And so, follow along with me. And as we do so, I would encourage you to just do whatever the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. If you feel comfortable sitting, then remain seated. And if you feel led to stand, raise your hands. Whatever it is that you feel led to do, just follow the Spirit's leading. There's no protocol this morning. There's no, there's no ritual. It's just allowing, I really want this to be a meditative journey through the scriptures so that we can really let this truth sink in. That Jesus is the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the prophecies that God has given to us since the time that Adam sinned in the garden. But before we do so, God made a declaration in the book of Isaiah concerning prophecy. Now technically prophecy is forthtelling. It's speaking forth the truth of God. But we typically think of it in terms of telling something about the future, something that hasn't happened yet. And in that specific light, God says through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 46, verses 8 through 10, Remember this. Fix it in, you, fix it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. And in this passage, God is saying through the prophet Isaiah that he is the only one who truly is outside of 
the domain that we know of as time. He's the only one who knows for sure what is going to happen in the end from the very beginning. It's almost as if he is floating above the parade of the events as they pass by in our lives one at a time, but he sees them all at once. And so God is declaring that he will make himself known as the God and the one and only God by declaring events before they happen. And the Bible is absolutely loaded with these things. But he also established in the Old Testament a standard of prophecy. And that standard is no less than absolute 100% pinpoint precise accuracy. No margin of error left for himself or any of the prophets that claim to speak in his name. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 11, Moses says, If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, Let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him. Serve him and hold fast to him. That prophet or dreamer must be put to death because he preached rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. He has tried to turn you from the way the Lord your God commanded you to follow. You must purge the evil from among you. If your very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you, saying, Let us go and worship other gods, gods that neither you nor your fathers have known, gods of the peoples around you, whether near or far, from one end of the land to the other. Do not yield to him or listen to him. Show him no pity. Do not spare him or shield him. You must certainly put him to death. Your hand must be the first in putting him to death and then the hands of all the people. Stone him to death because he tried to turn you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Then all Israel will hear and be afraid, and no one among you will do such an evil thing again. Now, that was the Old Testament covenant relationship that God had with the people of Israel. He's not necessarily commanding us to stone people that we encounter that worship other gods. I want to make that clear. But what he is saying, and particularly in the nation of Israel, with his people in the Old Covenant, he did have an absolute standard of purity. And anybody who tried to come in and bring sin into the camp would be dealt with very harshly. And concerning somebody who, who declared that he was speaking God's words, the standard was very clear. If he says something is going to happen and it doesn't, then he must be put to death. He has not spoken in my name. But even if what he says comes to pass, but he's telling you to worship another god, then they still must be put to death. That is a pretty strict standard. And amazingly enough, it gives us The God of the universe is putting himself out on the line because there are literally thousands of these proclamations of things that were going to happen that hadn't happened yet all throughout the Bible at the time that they were written. And if any one of these things were to not come to pass, then God is saying, then you can toss out the book as not coming from me. So, (coughs) 
Matthew 27, 31 through 35. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his clothes on him, put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Psalm 22:18. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Would you all turn with me to hymn number 324, When I Surveyed the Wondrous Cross. John 19, 19 through 22. Pilate had, noticed, had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, <coughs> Latin, and Greek. Chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, I have written what I have written.
This is a very curious event that happens during the crucifixion of Jesus. And it is Pontius Pilate, the Roman procurator, who officially had to pronounce Jesus to be crucified. He puts up a sign above Jesus, written in Aramaic, Greek, and in Latin, that says, the King of the Jews. And this made the religious leaders very upset. Was it just because it said, the King of the Jews? Or was there something more? I just want to show you something that I thought was pretty cool. This is what the sign would have looked like, at least in one of the languages that was up there. And it had four words. Yeshua HaNazari Melech Vamelech Hayudim. And if you take the first letter in each one of those words, it's yod he vav he Yahweh, the unpronounceable name of God. Now, did Pilate know what he was doing when he put this up there? Did he do it intentionally to put something in the side of the religious leaders? Or was it just something that happened by coincidence? Or was there something that was beyond Pilate that was controlling the events that were taking place? Matthew 27, verse 38. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8 and 9. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Would you turn with me to hymn number 157, The Love of God. Every man 
27 verses 39 through 44 those who passed by hurled insults at him shaking their heads and saying you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days save yourself come down from the cross if you were the son of God in the same way the chief priests the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him he saved others they said but he can't save himself he's the king of Israel let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Psalm 22, 6 through 8. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 4. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted.
Matthew 27, verses 45 through 46. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama samayachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer, by night, and am not silent. Do you turn with me to hymn number 343, Amazing Grace. Matthew 27, verses 46 through 50, 47 through 56. When some of those standing, were heard, standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. 
They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and and Josie, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. John 19, verse 31 through 37. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And and, And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Psalm 22, verses 16 and 17. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Hymn 337. Nothing but the blood. Bye. 
about the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Well, in that one chapter mainly, Matthew 27, they counted the crucifixion with the little inserts from John. We have some prophecies that were highlighted. That the soldiers would cast lots for Jesus' clothing that he would be assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Which, interestingly enough, he was crucified between two thieves, and then he was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. That he would be mocked as one smitten by God while his hands and feet were being pierced. That he would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not one of his bones would be broken, which, if you recall, it took a Roman soldier defying orders to make that happen. That when he saw Jesus was already dead, he didn't break his bones, but instead he stuck the spear through his side. And that he would be pierced for the sins of the people. There was a professor named Peter Stoner who, at one point, he encouraged his class, his students, to come up with some kind of calculation as to the odds of one person in history fulfilling just eight prophecies in the Old Testament of the Messiah by accident. And here's what they found, is that there's one chance in 10 to the 17th power, which you see all the zeros after that. I don't know what number that is. And that's eight prophecies. And just with one event, the crucifixion, we have even more that we could have highlighted this morning. Uh, not to mention the triumphal entry, his birth, his resurrection, all his, the things that happened in his ministry. And in fact, they say oh, three, approximately 300 prophecies that will, were fulfilled specifically during Jesus' lifetime. So what is it like to have one chance in 10 to the 17th power? Now, if we were to take the state of Texas and fill it two feet deep with silver dollars, and then we mark one of those silver dollars randomly somewhere in the pile, and then we take someone to be blindfolded and place them in the state of Texas and they walk around blindfolded, and the chances of them reaching down and finding the marked silver dollar is one chance in 10 to the 17th power. Any volunteers? <laughs> well, then they, they said, okay, well, that's eight prophecies. And by the way, the way that they did this was they took uh, an estimate of how many people have lived since the time that these prophecies were given on the earth. And that was the number they had to divide by. And they... With each prophecy, they had to try and come up with some kind of figure, and they used very conservative figures, by the way, and um, to find out what were the odds. How many people in history since that time have had that happen to them? So what about 16 prophecies? Well, the number jumps up real quick, and it's one chance in 10 to the 45th power, and that's a lot of zeros. So, what is that like? And this is where it gets a little bit hard for us to imagine. Because it's such a big number. We take a ball of silver dollars, and we fill that ball of silver dollars, the size of it is 30 times the distance from the earth to the sun. And then we mark one randomly, and then we send somebody in a space suit, blindfolded, floating through space, and the chances of them finding that silver dollar that we marked is one chance to the 45th power. 
Now, how about 48 prophecies? Now, this number is ridiculous. This actually goes beyond the point in which scientists throw up their hands and they say there's no way this could happen by accident. Um, and actually, it's the same exact um, chance that a strand of DNA could have come together the way that it was by accident or by random chance or by a process, however you would like to say it. So what is that like? Now we can't even use silver dollars. That's way too big. We need to use atoms because that's the smallest thing that we can reasonably think of. And we need to take a ball of atoms that contains every atom in the universe, which they say there's about 10 to the 66th power. And then we need to create one of those balls for every atom in the universe. So 10 to the 66 times 10 to the 66, and you have a lot of balls of atoms. And that gets us up to 10 and 132. We still have to get up to 10 and 157. And so now we need to conduct this experiment once a second for 16 billion years, which is how long the evolutionists say that it took to get us to the point where we're at now. And that still only gets us up to one chance in 10 to the 148th power. I, I don't even know how we would get up to the 10 to the 157th power. And that's 48 of the prophecies. And Jesus fulfilled approximately 300 different prophecies in his lifetime. I can't even imagine trying to figure out this, the odds of that. But here's my conclusion, is that if Jesus isn't the Messiah, then I'm not sure that I'm Jason Oaks. It's that, it's that ridiculous. It's that the evidence and the prophecies and the fulfillment of the prophecies is that blatant that for us to actually see that and to walk out of this room and to not at least think about it would be, um, would be very unheard of. At least I would think. I am more confident of the fact that Jesus is the Messiah than I am of any other single fact that you could ever name. In fact, in including the things that are obvious that I'm looking at in this room. There's no way that this could have happened by accident. And just even going back to the prophecies that we talked about, I noticed that you know, some people try to say that Jesus was aware of the prophecies and he was trying to intentionally fulfill them one by one. Well, when you come to the crucifixion, I don't even know how you would play that out. He would have to have orchestrated so many different elements. And we have soldiers defying orders, Roman soldiers defying orders. You have soldiers that choose to take his, his garments and instead of ripping them up into shreds, they say, hey, you know, this is a valuable garment, so let's cast lots for it. Let's gamble for it unintentionally fulfilling prophecy. You have almost the very words of the people at the foot of the cross as they're mocking Jesus. And they're saying, you believed in God, then let him rescue you. You have some of the words that Jesus actually says from the cross, and that you have not one of his bones being broken after going through the flogging, the crown of thorns, the beatings, and then the crucifixion. And, and that the, intentionally mentions that his hands and his feet would be pierced. Which crucifixion is one of the only methods that I know of that even fits that description of how you would go about executing somebody. And so what is the point of all this is that there is evidence, that there is something solid that we can place our faith on. That faith itself, it's not, you can't just have faith in anything. If you have faith in something that isn't reliable, then it can't really actually be faith. 
Faith is something that you're willing to stake your life on. It's something that you're willing to base your entire existence on, your entire eternity on. It better be solid. And with Jesus, it's absolutely solid. 